with us. <laughs> this is the big switch. Um, you know, I, I kept saying that in the past one, and it truly is. So, you know, now I kind of put my um, psychopathology um, teacher instructor hat on um, from back when I used to teach um, grad or well, I did teach some graduate um, classes, but I also taught undergrads um, at the University of Colorado in Boulder and taught psychopathology labs. And that's where um, I used to teach per about personality disorders a lot. I was just telling Alejandra, you know, that at the time, you know, we talked a lot about, you know, all these different mental health conditions. And, um, and I used to think that some of this stuff was only at that time, it felt more important to me than it does now, you know, as a, a clinical psychologist has been in practice for about 10 years. Um, I don't think I've ever diagnosed somebody with a personality disorder. It's, yeah, it's just not helpful. Um, for, for most of the time for people. And so anyways, um, we'll, we'll talk more about my own thoughts about, um, you know, these diagnoses and criticisms of these diagnoses and, you know, how thinking about these things and getting a better understanding of what people are dealing with and how they're feeling about things can, can help you better understand um, people that you may be working with and, and maybe better understand your, yourself as well too. So once again, my name is Kyle Davis. I'm originally an Oklahoman. I um, went to graduate school at the University of Colorado in Boulder, um, really started focusing on becoming a health psychologist whenever I did an internship at the University of California, San Diego's Department of Psychiatry about 10 years ago, and moved out to Boise in 2013, and have done a, a number of different things um, since that time, both administrative and clinical um, within St. Luke's healthcare system. More recently, um, I started working with the Lifestyle Medicine Clinic at St. Luke's in 2019, where I teach uh, health education classes and health behavior change classes. And then I also had an insomnia clinic at St. Luke's that I um, had been running for like five years. And I moved that into a private practice this, um, about a year ago. So these days I spend my time um, splitting it between my private practice primarily helping folks um, with sleep disorders, but also do some other more general type of therapy as well. And then um, I also teach um, these classes for lifestyle medicine and I love it. And every once in a while I get to teach um, these kinds of classes um, as well. So some specific information about this class, you know, because I'm not teaching about personality disorders on a regular basis, I reached out to one of my, well, mentors and colleagues um, Dr. Tina Pittman Wagers. So she is an awesome instructor uh, or teaching professor at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And she sent me some slides um, that she used. So you can trust that you're getting excellent, um, you know, material that Dr. Pittman Wagers um, put together. And she was kind enough to share that with me um, um, a couple years ago. So when I do these kinds of presentations, I don't have to, to reinvent the, the wheel. So shout out to Dr. Pittman Wagers. Um, okay, so first thing I wanna talk to you all about, actually, let me see if I, I lost my little questions box. Maybe, can somebody type in a response in the questions box and let's see if I can get that back. I don't know, quite know how <laughs> I lost it. Uh, Sometimes it likes to hide behind your main screen. So if you minimize it, it might be hanging out there. All right, thanks Alejandra. I'll see if I can do that without messing things up. Yes, okay. Stay there. And I should have kept it snapped into my toolbar before I moved it. I think that's the my problem. Okay. Um, Let me see if I can provide some support I, as well. I'm sure it's just like one of these little boxes I have to click on. Um, okay, I got that back, but now I just see myself. Um, can you all still see the slides? No, we'll have to um, screen share from scratch. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. 
You are all good. Thank you all for your help with um, typing those things in the chat. All right, we're back on. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, and now I've got my little box back too. So, okay, yeah, and thanks everybody for your your feedback. I've got you trained to use the <laughs> the question box now, and you're super helpful. Okay, so moving on, so let's talk about like what personality traits are first. So, personality traits are really important in understanding um, personality disorders. So, whenever we talk about personality traits, what we're talking to are enduring patterns of perceiving, relating to, and thinking about the environment and oneself that are exhibited in a wide range of social and personal context. Um, so some examples of that, um, you know, would be like, maybe you describe yourself as being a shy person, or you would describe yourself or somebody else as being dramatic or outgoing or temperamental or, or easily upset. So if you were um, on the, the outside looking at yourself, how do you think someone would describe your personality traits? Um, what were some things that would um, stand out to you? I know I'll, I'll share some of mine. Um, and this this feels kind of, it's kind of weird to say, but I'm actually pretty introverted. Um, I love teaching and, you know, if I'm teaching a class, I'm pretty extroverted. Um, but just in my normal day-to-day -day life, I'm a pretty introverted um, guy, um, and I like to think I'm witty. Um, so the, those would be some the personality traits um, that you know I would um, I would use, or that I think people would say about me. I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe it's true. Maybe it's not. Um, okay, so some people are saying they're funny, they're outgoing, they're loud, they're bubbly, talkative. Um, so another really interesting thing to think about in terms and hopefully some more of you will chime in here too about your, your personality traits is basically like any one of these traits that we're talking about um, could exist on a continuum and that's really important to understand about personality traits as we lead into personality disorders because we all are going to share some of these different personality traits but depending to what extent um, they kind of um, dominate your personality and how that ends up affecting your life. Um, that's what would dictate whether or not um, somebody would um, could be having a, a disorder. Um, so once again, we all share um, these different kinds of traits that we're going to be reviewing today. And it's really a matter of degree that would, you know, separate somebody um, from potentially having or meeting diagnostic criteria for a um, yeah, personality disorder. So generally, when we're talking about personality disorders, this um, means that there's an enduring pattern of an inner experience for someone and behavior that deviates markedly from the expectations of the individual's culture, that it's pervasive and inflexible. So this is not just you know in certain situations you act this way but this is kind of like cutting across different parts of your life oftentimes well it, it does have an onset in adolescence or early adulthood is stable over time and this is leading to distress or impairment in somebody's life and that's so important in understanding and and also i, I should point out that the, that distress and impairment may be was usually experienced by the individual that would be diagnosed with the disorder or it could be that they're causing distress or impairment to other people too, because there are some of these um, personality disorder traits that would make people fairly oblivious to how they were affecting other people, or they may not care how they were affecting um, other people. So um, you're also going to see the pattern manifested in two or more of the following areas. Um, so like in somebody's cognition, um, so their perception and interpretation of self, how they're thinking about themselves, how they think about other people, how they think about different things going on in their lives and in the world, um, their affect, so the range, intensity, lability, appropriateness of emotional responses. Um, we think about that interpersonal um, functioning, you know, how they're interacting with people in other relationships and um, also impulse control. Um, so once again, it would have to be 
two or more of those following areas um, where they would start um, experiencing um, difficulties. So how common are personality disorders? Well, there's a lot of variability here. Um, so the studies show that maybe between like four to 15% of the population could be diagnosed with a personality disorder, probably depending on how you define whether or not it's causing problems in somebody's life. And interestingly, um, about 50% of folks diagnosed with any one of the personality disorders would also meet criteria for at least another personality disorder. And 75% of people diagnosed with a personality disorder would also meet criteria for another disorder um, in the, the DSM. So I don't know, what's your all's um, knee-jerk reaction to that? Hearing that 50% of people um, that meet criteria for one personality disorder would also meet criteria for another um, disorder. I'm scanning the, the box to see your um, reactions. Okay, so people are, yeah, these are interesting responses. So there are clusters of personality disorders that co-occur together, but it wouldn't necessarily mean that the people would meet criteria for the other disorders in that um, cluster. Um, and you're saying, well, yeah, you know, normal, it's normal for people to have dual diagnoses. Um, yeah, some people are saying probably a lot undiagnosed or misdiagnosed. And, you know, I think probably a, a big deal here is you see there's a lot of overlap in the symptoms. And that's exactly what Catherine points out here. So maybe we're talking about the same thing, but we're calling it different things based on how people fall into the, the categories. And so, you know, what I was telling Alejandra earlier is that I don't, you know, like if I see a diagnosis of a personality disorder in somebody's chart, it, you know, I, I take that with a grain of salt. You know, it's like, okay, you know, these are, you know, I've got a, an idea of a very small idea about what somebody, how they may present, how they may interact with me. But more often than not, that information is not um, all that helpful. Um, and at least for me and being able to, to work with that person or, or help that person. So there's a lot of, there's actually quite a bit of controversy about personality disorders in the DSM-5. So when we say DSM, you know, it sounds like you all are pretty familiar with this, but the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders that the American Psychiatric Association puts out, we're now on DSM-5-TR or the, the revised version DSM-5 came out several years ago, and then it got updated um, this past spring. But basically, there was a there was a there were talk there was talk about completely overhauling the way that the DSM classified personality disorders. And basically, what happened was they threw it all out and kept the the old system. And so we're still using the same system that we've been using for a long time. It probably is not um, maybe not all that helpful. Um, for folks, but it's what we're, it's what we have. Um, so some of the problems with this and that can lead to misdiagnosis personality disorders, the definitions of the disorders themselves are not super tightly defined. Um, there are inferred patterns of behavior. So we think people are going to act certain ways that maybe they do, maybe they don't. Um, it requires subjective judgment. Um, you know, like we're judging the people that we're diagnosing with these conditions because the, they are not necessarily talking about the problems that they're having or their personality traits. Um, the categories are not mutually exclusive. There are really high comorbidity rates. Anytime you see these really high comorbidity rates, that doesn't necessarily mean that these are set, that these people just have these separate conditions. Once again, they may be just having, they're who they are and they're having problems with different parts in their lives that human beings have labeled 
and said, you know, these different things mean different things. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. Um, there's also a lot of gender bias um, in the different personality disorders. And so you see, you know, certain types of disorders way more prevalent um, with certain gender identities. And, you know, once again, that probably tells you that something is a little fishy about this. And um, so anyways, take this stuff with a grain of salt um, because it's, it's interesting to talk about and think about, um, but in terms of, you know, having a slam dunk, like, oh, I know what is going on with this person. Now I know what to do to help them. Not as helpful <laughs> in that kind of way. Not like, you know, for me, knowing that somebody has a diagnosis of insomnia, I've got a really good idea of going about how to help them with that. Knowing that somebody has a diagnosis of like schizotypal personality disorder is not necessarily going to be super helpful in um, treating that, that person. Um, I'm checking out the comments real quick before I move on because I'm probably getting people to, yeah, <laughs> raising some questions. Um, oh, yeah, so here's an example. You know, somebody saying, um, I was originally diagnosed with four different personality disorders, <laughs> but now I'm a lot more familiar with what they are. I feel like I was misdiagnosed. Yeah, I bet you were. Um, you know, and oftentimes, you know, the people making these diagnoses are not even like super well trained um, to make the diagnoses themselves. Um, you know, a lot of times this is coming like from primary care providers and geez, primary care providers have to do so much different stuff. And I, I wouldn't expect them to know the ins and outs of all the personality disorders, but that's where a lot of these diagnoses are made and they stick with people for a long time. Um, and it may not be all that helpful. Oh, interesting, Mark. Are personality disorders covered by insurance the same as other DSM disorders? You know, the insurance companies are probably just looking at um, diagnostic codes. And I think the personality disorders would, since they're mental health diagnoses, would be F codes. So, yeah, they probably would be covered. But almost anybody seeking help would also meet criteria for another type of disorder that your treatment would probably focus on more. Um, and somebody else said that they were told they had personality disorders traits and, oh, okay, yeah. And you see, the psychiatrist diagnosed them with a disorder because it could be helpful from an insurance um, perspective, but then the, their therapist disagreed with the diagnosis. So yeah, there's a lot about this, you know, that hopefully you're just raising question marks for yourself <laughs> about this. Um, yeah, there, and somebody in Catherine saying they seem really polarizing negative connotations. Yeah, they certainly, they certainly can. So all, so now that I've said, don't, don't pay too much attention to all this, <laughs> let's talk about what we're actually talking about and what's interesting about them. And if you are working with people that have these conditions, you know, what, what can be helpful and working with them. So, um, the, so some of you mentioned earlier, the paranoid or the personality disorders are clustered into three clusters. Um, so one is characterized by odd um, or eccentric behaviors, which is very culturally relevant, which, you know, DSM tries to help people understand, but is difficult. Um, and cluster B includes um, the emotional, erratic, or dramatic types of behaviors, including antisocial, personality disorder, borderline, histrionic, and narcissistic. Cluster C, fear and anxiety, characterized by fear and anxiety. Um, we've got avoidant personality disorder, dependent personality disorder, and obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Yeah, and people are saying, well, yep, Kyle, they have F codes, and you can treat them with um, therapy codes. But once again, you know, most of the people that are actually seeking help are probably going to meet diagnostic criteria for um, something else as well. Okay, so first up are cluster A disorders. So paranoid personality disorder. And also, I wanted to say that I was really uncomfortable, like, picking out pictures for personality disorders. Um, I wanted to make my slides slightly more entertaining. But please don't think that the pictures I chose um, are really accurate representations of what it would be like to have these personality disorders. Um, that uh, it was not my intention, and I'll, I'll be more specific about that. 
um, later on. So anyways, paranoid personality disorder characterized by a pattern of pervasive distrust and suspiciousness of others. So three hallmark behaviors that you would see, they don't trust their friends, they hold grudges against people, and oftentimes they feel like they're the victim of different things going on um, in their lives. Prevalence is real low, you know, a half to two and a half percent of the population, more common in males and females. Um, you know, when you're thinking about etiology, they, there could be a connection to schizophrenia here. Um, you know, I was talking earlier about personality traits and um, like you think about a continuum. Like how much um, distrust does somebody have on a zero to a hundred scale? Um, you also see some of this kind of stuff with um, overlapping with other mental health conditions. So something like schizophrenia, um, you know, and we'll also talk about this with schizotypal personality disorder, but this could be like almost like schizophrenia light. You know, it's like they don't meet full diagnostic criteria for schizophrenia, but they're having some of these other like similarities, problems going on in their lives. Um, also, you know, oftentimes, you know, people would have um, probably experiencing trauma, maybe neglect um, in their early upbringing. Probably unsurprising to you all, maybe they had good reason to be paranoid um, that they couldn't trust people, they didn't have a safe upbringing. Maybe there were people out. Um, to get them or their parents, or they're kind of taught that um, to always be skeptical about other people or other people's intentions. And so you can imagine, you know, that if you grew up in a in that kind of environment, um, it would could be pretty easy to, you know, become more paranoid um, later on. So, you know, in terms of treatment, in terms of you know, as a, a peer. For most of these personality disorders, people do not end up seeking treatment for a personality disorder because they this is really consistent with how they see themselves. They don't necessarily see that they've got a problem. You know, somebody with parano paranoid personality disorder wouldn't say, you know, I've got a problem with being too paranoid about things. Can you help me? They would say, you're out to get me. Um, you know, you're just somebody else that I can't trust. Um, and so once again, the the likelihood that you would run into somebody seeking treatment for something like this is, is not all that high. Um, however, if you were working with somebody like this, um, I think you would do a lot of work in cognitive therapy talking about how their thoughts or beliefs about things may not be entirely accurate. Um, people could have other intentions than what their mind is telling them this other person is thinking. And so you would really try to help them like learn how to look at things more objectively. But once again, you know, it's just uh, it's just not all that likely that you're you're going to run into, um, you know, somebody seeking help with that. They may be having other problems in their life that they want help with. And that's probably more, you know, where you're going to be able to help somebody. And you're like, oh, OK, this person, you know, is also experiencing a lot of um, mistrust and skepticism. And, you know, that's something that I'm going to try to to work with so that I can help them with this other thing that they're interested in. Um, let me see. Oh, you're talking about dissociative identity disorder. Um, I don't believe that that's a personality disorder. I could be wrong. It's been a while since I taught psychopathology, Lisa. Um, where would schizoaffective disorder fall? So, yeah, so we'll, like some of you are, are getting at this, you know, that there are um, other other types of disorders out there that are not personality disorders. Um, so like dissociative identity disorder, schizoaffective disorder, um, like schizophreniform disorder, schizophrenia, those would fall in the psychotic spectrum disorders, um, you know, not the personality disorder. Um, so there's overlap in the symptoms, but, you know, once again, it's just, you're not going to run it. Well, you say a half to two and a half percent for paranoid personality disorder, super low. And then the percentage of those people that would seek treatment would be even lower. Um, would this be linked with narcissism? Um, not necessarily, yeah, not, probably not. People just don't trust other people. They don't think there's anything special about themselves. Um, 
What about um, borderline personality disorder? We'll get that. We'll get to that later on, Conan. All right. Next up, um, schizoid personality disorder. I was trying to find like a non-judgmental picture of a hermit that didn't impede on <laughs> copyright infringement, so I couldn't find it. But I found a, a cabin in the woods. Um, not that somebody with schizoid personality disorder would probably live in a cabin that looked quite like this, um, but maybe they would. Um, anyways. Um, Schizoid personality disorder is characterized by indifference to social relationships, flat affect, restricted range of emotions. Um, they don't feel things real strongly. Um, you know, maybe they're sensitive to other people's opinions, but they're not really going to express that. Um, and, you know, they don't really, um, people with this condition, you know, wouldn't really desire intimacy in their lives, you know, they, or close relationships, they are fine being by themselves. Um, you know, this is gonna occur in less than 1% of males, and then that's more common in men than in women. Um, uh, it's unclear, you know, what could be causing it, maybe some over, overlap with autism spectrum disorders. Um, you know, maybe these are people that experience abuse and neglect and just learn early on that, people are dangerous, you know, and they don't want anything to do with other people. Um, and then in terms of treatment, um, you would really, really have to work on developing a relationship with them, um, developing, helping them develop empathy for other people, um, social skills um, to interact with other people. But the thing is, you know, the, this person is probably not going to be all that interested in therapy in the first place. Because once again, that's the thing about these personality disorders is we say they're egocentric. It's consistent with how they view themselves and how they see things. So they, you don't have this like outside looking in perspective because you're living it. And if you think that if you truly don't care about having other relationships with people, you're probably not going to go seek therapy to learn how to want to form relationships with people because you didn't want that in the first place. Um, does that, does that make sense to folks? Oh, cool. I'm just reading some of the, the comments here. Um, somebody that was diagnosed with schizophrenia, um, All right, any questions about schizoid personality disorder before I move on? Oh yeah, Ellen has a good point. Yeah, so this is indifference, not hatred of other people. Correct. Yeah, they just don't care. Um, you know, they just don't desire relationships. And so like, that's why I think like the mount, like a mountain man kind of hermit thing, like I can go live off in the woods by myself and be totally happy and not care about other relationships. That's the kind of person that we're, we're talking about here that's not caused by another mental health condition and not caused by a medication or a substance. So yeah, there's just not that many people left um, that could fit into this criteria. There's some out there, but just not many. All right, next up, schizotypal personality disorder. So this is one that I felt like I really didn't, I wanted to put a picture of somebody who was dressed um, different than cultural norms, um, but I also don't want you to think that, oh yeah, people that look like this have schizotypal personality disorder. This could be a guy that wants to wear that. Who cares? Uh, anyways, um, somebody that did have schizotypal personality or schizotypal personality disorder, um, they would have the symptoms of being suspicious of other people, um, probably restricted affect, probably not very many friends, um, ideas of reference, or like thinking that they're getting like messages um, from different things, from like a divine power or something, the world's talking to them, God's talking to them. Um, they've got strange, they may have strange beliefs, superstitions strange perceptual experiences. Maybe they um, see things that other people can't see, or, but not like a, not like full on psychosis, but just like they're seeing things and other things that other people don't see, but without actually thinking they saw something that wasn't there. Um, they have odd thoughts, um, behaviors, prevalence up to 3% in the general population, more common in males and females. Um, probably some overlap um, with schizophrenia and um, treatment. You know, once again, maybe they'll um, respond to antipsychotic medications, treatment for depression, um, social skills training could be helpful. 
um, you know, I, I got to think that there was a, a guy in my hometown who went by um, just in time. And whenever I thought about a schizotypal personality disorder, I'm like, that's, that's my example of this person. He owned a, um, a vacuum repair shop. He was in a, a rock band um, called Nuclear Devastation and was just like a, just a really interesting guy. Um, you know, but I saw him like talk about some of these ideas of reference before, like feeling like lightning or something and just like interesting stuff, you know, but he was getting along just fine um, for himself in the world. You know, I and that's why I'm reluctant to call some of these kinds of things disorders, because like in his case, it wasn't really causing him any problems. Um, he was happy with who he was. And once again, he wasn't causing trouble for anyone else um, or himself. And, you know, maybe he has these clusters of symptoms. But, you know, I just I feel uncomfortable like labeling it um, whenever it's uh, yeah not causing anybody trouble. So once again, I guess in order to meet diagnostic criteria, it would have to be causing trouble in someone's life. So that's what we, we fall back on. All right. Here's one that you may have thought a little bit more about before. Um, antisocial personality disorder. So this is a pervasive pattern of disregard for in violation of the rights of others that begins in childhood or early adolescence and continues into adulthood, characterized by impulsive, aggressive, irresponsible behavior, deceitfulness, lying, lack of remorse. They don't care that they did something um, unkind to somebody else. Seen in about 1% of females, 3% um, of males. And um, the specific diagnostic criteria um, that would occur since the age of 15 would be failure to obey laws and norms by engaging in behavior which results in criminal arrest or would warrant criminal arrest, lying, deception, manipulation um, for profit or their own self-amusement, um, impulsive behavior, irritability, aggression, um, you know, maybe you see these folks frequently getting into fights, assaulting other people, um, disregard of safety for themselves and other people, irresponsible behavior, lack of remorse for actions. Um, so in order to, to meet diagnostic criteria for this, somebody has to be at least eight, eight, 18 years old. And you're going to see this pattern of behavior starting off whenever they're even younger than that. So. Um, like conduct disorder would be present um, before the age of, of 15. And, you know, antisocial personality disorder characterized by this lack of empathy for other people. Um, it's, it's scary. You know, we've got a picture of Hannibal Lecter here, you know, that there are people out there that um, truly like just don't have any empathy for other people and or experience what we call psychopathy and yeah, frankly, it's scary. Um, you know, when you talk about treatment for this, you basically have to come at it from the angle of how not taking advantage of other people, not being mean to people would benefit them in the, the long run. Um, and that's kind of like, you're going to have a better time living the life that you want to live. If you don't hurt other people, you don't take advantage of other people. Um, and that's kind of the selling point. Because otherwise, they wouldn't have any motivation um, to, to change. Any questions about that one? Probably not surprising to you. You would see higher prevalence of, you know, these kinds of conditions like in our um, uh, uh, jail or what am I saying? Jail system, yeah. Corrective institutions. All right, um, don't see any questions about that. Histrionic personality disorder. So here's another picture. Um, I don't want you to think that I think Lady Gaga has histrionic personality disorder, but she does wear outrageous clothing um, that gets a lot of attention. Um, and that's the only reason I have her here. So um, for somebody to meet diagnostic criteria for histrionic personality disorder, there has to be a pervasive and excessive um, emotionality and attention-seeking behavior. 
oftentimes people will use their physical appearance to um, get attention from other people. Um, they may have provocative, seductive interactions with others, um, you know, trying, like giving people the perception that they have close relationships or that they're really interested with them to get more um, interaction. They may have like really vague speech, you know, like you listen to them and they're talking to you and you're like, did you just say anything? Or were you just making wor were words just coming out of your mouth? Um, they would oftentimes have misperceptions of relationship status thinking that a relationship was more serious um, than the other person did. Um, prevalence is really low again, you know, under 2%. And um, treatment would be focused more on the idea that, you know, any sort of short-term gains that they were getting from attention um, would have long-term cost, you know, and ultimately probably not helping somebody get um, what they, they wanted in, in life. Um, okay, next up, narcissistic personality disorder. Um, so yeah, this is one that we hear about a lot, a lot about because uh, narcissism or having narcissistic traits um, is something that's easy to spot sometimes in other people, and it makes other people feel not really good. And so, you know, we pay attention to it. So the, the actual diagnostic criteria would be characterized by a pervasive pattern of grandiosity. Um, you know, so thinking that you're probably more important than you are, um, having a need for admiration from other people, um, also having a lack of empathy, so some uh, similarity to antisocial personality disorder there. This has to begin in early adulthood and be present in a variety of contexts um, with five or more of the following um, symptoms. So one, um, having a grandiose sense of self-importance, like exaggerating your achievements in life and your talents. Um, you expect to be recognized as superior um, without having anything to back that up. Um, being preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, um, being perfect, ideal love. Um, maybe believing that you um, have a that you're special and unique, and only other people. Um, that are similar to you could possibly understand you because other people are below you. Um, you can only associate with other special or high status people. Um, they're really kind of fueled by admiration from other people. Um, they oftentimes have a strong sense of entitlement, um, unreasonable expectations of especially favorable treatment or automatic compliance um, with his or her expectations. They could be interpersonally exploitative, um, taking advantage of other people to get what they want. Um, they would lack empathy, unwilling to recognize or identify with the feelings and needs of other people. Doesn't matter, that's not my problem. Um, is often envious of others or believe that others are envious of him or her. They're oftentimes um, arrogant, um, haughty behaviors or attitudes. 1% uh, of the population see it more commonly in men. Um, and, you know, I think when you take it, it's really hard sometimes to have empathy um, for people with these kinds of traits. You know, but underlying all this is oftentimes people that feel really unimportant and scared. And, you know, they are faking their way through life to the point where they start believing what they're telling themselves um, because they never had like a solid foundation to, to start off with. Really, at least that's how I try to think about it so I can find empathy um, because these people are not pleasant to be around. Um, so, you know, oftentimes, you know, if you look at their childhoods, they never had good examples of empathy their parents were rewarding these kinds of behaviors. They were seeing the same thing in their parents and they're trying to emulate that. And they never, they don't get off to a good start, you know? So like maybe they're like really focused on physical appearance, superficial characteristics, um, you know? And, you know, it's like maybe the kid is having a hard time with something and the only thing they hear from their parents is that they look messy or something like that. You know, they'd have no empathy for their kids' feelings. And then the kid learns, well, I guess the only thing that's important here is how I, my physical appearance or, you know, or like putting off an impression of being powerful or, or something like that. 
I'm sure we can all think of examples of people that may fall into this um, category. All right, so treatment for narcissistic personality disorder, um, really kind of similar to antisocial personality disorder. Um, you know, starting off, you know, people have to feel like they're getting something out of it, you know, to get buy-in from them. Um, and so, yeah, like cognitive therapy aimed at perceptions of what's desirable, attainable, um, helping them think about things more objectively, helping them cope with criticism because they are not going to handle that well. Um, we would try to help them build empathy, understand how their actions affect other people. Um, you know, and they probably have other mental health issues. It's hard to imagine feeling good about yourself um, if you're acting this way. You know, so they probably are experiencing depression. They're probably running in the, into other interpersonal issues in their lives because people wouldn't want to be around them. Um, you know, they maybe get close to people for a while and then they push them away. And once again, it's really sad. Um, but these are also folks that you may not want to spend any time with because you get burned um, whenever you um, try to help them sometimes. All right, next up, borderline personality disorder. So this is characterized by a pervasive pattern of instability of interpersonal relationships, self-image and mood, market impulsivity that begins by early adulthood, present in a variety of contexts. Also, um, they are very sensitive um, to uh, abandonment, whether that's real or imagined. You know, this is kind of the underlying fear driving borderline personality disorder. And, um, you know, oftentimes people have ex feelings of emptiness, they're paranoid about what's going to happen next. They, they may experience dissociation or feel just kind of disconnected from their bodies. Um, and, you know, and then they'll do things like engage in self-harm sometimes to help them feel um, alive or connected to their bodies, you know, and then that can run and that can cause them a lot of problems. Um, so it's about, it affects about 2% of the general population. 75% um, of those diagnosed with border, borderline personality disorder um, are female, or identify as female, um, high risk of suicide. Um, at least 6% of folks will commit suicide. And there's oftentimes high comorbidity with other disorders, so mood disorders, bipolar disorder, uh, major depressive disorder, other anxiety disorders, substance use disorders, um, eating disorders. And I think borderline personality disorder is maybe like one of the exceptions in terms of the personality disorders that you do end up seeing more people seeking help with or seeking help for, and that's great news um, because we have really, really good treatment um, for borderline personality disorder called dialectical behavior therapy. Um, and I, as somebody who's practiced DBT before, it is, um, God bless the people that, that do DBT on a regular basis because it's difficult work, um, you know, and challenging people to work with at times. And it can also be incredibly rewarding. Um, because you can really, you know, make a, a gigantic change in somebody's life. And um, yeah, so anyways, it's a, a, a condition that is can, that is treatable. Um, but, you know, these people are experiencing so much suffering um, in their lives that there's, well, I guess there's a lot of room for improvement and helping them feel better. Um, see a very high incidence of early trauma in people that experience borderline personality disorder. You know, this fear of abandonment is real. They have oftentimes experienced a lot of abandonment in their lives. Um, they've oftentimes experienced a lot of neglect, um, a lot of hostility. Um, their feelings have been invalidated over and over again. Oftentimes they've had a, or they've lost a parent or separated from a parent early on. They never like developed a strong connection with a parent, um, feel abandoned. Um, five times more likely among first degree relatives. And that may be because you know of genetic factors associated with that or environmental factors associated with that the the impulsivity and affective instability may be inherited you know but then also you know if you're growing up in that kind of environment and you're more likely to also 
live in a chaotic environment later on, then, you know, it would become more likely that you could see that in your children. So treatment of borderline personality disorder. So like I said, dialectical behavior therapy is our go-to treatment developed by um, Marsha Linehan, who's at the, I believe she's still at the University of Washington. Um, she's diagnosed, actually, she wrote about this um, with borderline personality disorder herself. Um, and the treatment focuses on helping patients cope more adaptively with stressors. So they have coping skills to use in the face of stress, um, keeping them safe, um, decreasing suicidal behaviors and gestures, um, increasing interpersonal effectiveness. There's a lot of work on communication skills with other people, um, problem solving training. So they've got skills that they can rely on to solve problems in their lives instead of how they learned to deal with problems early on. Um, we would help them identify and regulate their emotions, learn to trust their own responses. Mindfulness training is a big component of um, dialectical behavior therapy. So people can learn to, to notice their thoughts and feelings more objectively. And then also, oftentimes people have experienced um, significant trauma. And so treatment um, for post-traumatic stress disorder um, would also oftentimes um, be a part of treatment for borderline personality disorder. All right, next up, avoidant personality disorder. Um, so this would be a pervasive pattern of social inhibition, feelings of inadequacy, hypersensitivity, hypersensitivity to negative evaluation, um, a lot of overlap with mood and anxiety disorders. Um, once again, prevalence really low, uh, half to 1% of population, equal rates of men and women. Um, in terms of etiology, um, these people have probably experienced um, rejection from their parents. A lot of feelings of guilt, isolation, not very much affection. Um, you know, maybe they had difficult temperaments to start with. And then um, treatment um, would be very similar to the kinds of treatments that we would use for um, social phobia. So systematic desensitization, behavioral rehearsal. And, you know, I think... Um, really important to point out here that when you look at a condition like schizoid personality disorder versus avoidant personality disorder, somebody with schizoid personality disorder doesn't care about having relationships with other people. Somebody with avoidant personality disorder may look similar on the outside because they don't have a lot of close relationships, but underlying that would be this um, fear of evaluation you know, that other people are going to judge them, think less of them, and validate them, be mean to them. And that's what drives um, their avoidant behavior, not forming relationships with other people. So big difference there. Um, you know, one person wants relationships, but is scared of them. The other one, schizoid, you know, you just wouldn't care about relationships in the, the first place. So that's an important difference to point out because they can look um, similar from the outside. Next up, um, dependent personality disorder. So this would be characterized by a pervasive and excessive need to be taken care of that leads to submissive and clinging behavior and fears of separation. Affects about 2% of folks. Um, etiology, parent-child bonding may have been interrupted. Um, that way the, the kid never had a chance to move from being dependent on their parents to being independent in a supportive kind of environment. And treatment would be all about helping that person become more independent um, and helping them realize that they could do things um, for themselves um, and not have to rely on other people um, for that. So yeah, very much focused on their self-esteem and helping them yeah, gain independence in their, their lives. I'm going through these slides a lot quicker than my last ones. Um, so I've got about 10 minutes left. And I think I'm on my almost my last slide. So I have some time for questions. Um, so next up, obsessive compulsive personality disorder. So this is very different than obsessive compulsive disorder, though they have a very similar name. So the personality disorder um, folks would be preoccupation with orderliness, perfectionism, 
and mental and interpersonal control at the expense of flexibility, openness, and efficiency. Um, you'll see, you know, I always thought that, you know, I would see traits of obsessive compulsive personality disorder um, in a lot of the, actually a lot of professors I worked with in graduate school, because they're so occupied by perfection, being perfectionistic about things, um, you know, like, especially with like academic writing, um, that it can be really disabling um, for folks at, at times, you know, they just can't get as much stuff done because they're so um, focused on being um, perfect or doing things exactly right. Um, they don't necessarily have obsessive th thoughts and compulsive behaviors like you see in obsessive compulsive disorder, you know, not necessarily like fears of contamination or, or something like that. But really just, it would be like making things right. Um, you know, it would probably be what how they would feel about it if you were, were talking to them. Um, you got to do it right. Um, and the prevalence, 4% um, in the general population, more common in men than women. Maybe some genetic links there, once again, would probably also overlap with the environment. And, you know, if you have a parent with OCPD, they're probably projecting um, some of those, um, they, their beliefs about things on their kids. And so the kids are going to learn that too. Um, you know, like parental expectations of conformity, neatness, you got to do it this way. Um, and treatment um, could be fun if you had somebody who was, um, you know, willing to, to tolerate a lot of discomfort, um, but you would target the fears that underlie the need for orderliness, um, you know, also probably helping them with relaxation, um, acceptance of different situations, you know, recognizing that um, things don't have to be perfect all the time in order for them to be acceptable. Um, I'm curious, do y'all think you know uh, people in your life or you can think of examples of obsessive compulsive personality disorder? I know I, I think about a friend who gets um, caught up in projects sometimes and gets really um, perfectionistic about things. And it's really hard um, for him to, to accomplish them or get them done because he'll get so caught up in the details of trying to make it perfect that it's hard to ever, um, you know, carry something through to completion because he could have done it better or there's a better way to do it. And, you know, that can be really paralyzing. Yeah, maybe, maybe this is one that you notice um, some of these traits in yourself, um, you know, and if it's keeping you from getting things done, um, you're spending way too much time on something, you know, then, yeah, there may be some some room for um, feeling better in your life. Let me look at the comments here. Yeah, and some of you, are, <laughs> you, you may notice this in like little part in parts of your lives. Um, you know, like I know as, as I get older, uh, my beliefs about the way that uh, the dishes go in a dishwasher have gotten stronger and stronger, um, you know, and I don't think I have obsessive compulsive personality disorder, but, you know, there are certain things that you want to be a certain way. But that gives you like um, kind of a peek into the mind of somebody with obsessive compulsive personality disorder if all sorts of things like that are were like that in their life. Um, you know, that's more of what the personality disorder would look like um, versus, you know, having um, some of your own um, hang ups on like controlling um, different things in your your life. Yeah, Cynthia, you know that there's probably some overlap with, um, you know, some uh, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder um, symptoms and what you're describing. Yeah, great point, Stephanie. Um, so she said, you know, people often call OCPD simply obsessive compulsive disorder, but they are very different conditions, um, you know, where the personality traits are more, um, it's really having control over the environment, um, you know, and yeah, so that's different than like specific thoughts um, and feeling like you're compelled to do something to, to make the um, uncomfortable thought go away. 
Yeah. So Heather's example, you know, going the wrong way home, you know, somebody gets upset. That's the kind of thing that we would try to increase acceptance of, you know, like, hey, let's do it a different way this time and, you know, be okay with that. So they could realize, oh, okay, there's a different way to do this. And that was okay. Um, yeah, these, these examples are interesting. Yeah. Um, Sandra said, would that be thought blocking if you try and stop thinking down that path? I am a bigger fan of, um, acceptance, <laughs> you know, noticing a thought and letting it be and recognizing that you don't have to act on it just because it was in your, your head. Um, you know, that would probably be more of the, the angle that I would take. Um, <laughs> When you start getting to know people, yeah, you'll have all sorts of these weird things. You know, like Lisa says, I try not to do things in threes. Where, where does that stuff come from? So once again, you know, if it's not causing you big trouble in your life, um, you know, we all have our own little peculiarities, um, you know, but when it's really causing problems in your life, um, you know, and, and this is pervasive in different areas of your life, you know, not just in a certain situation. It happens at work, it happens at home, it happens with friends. Um, you know, then that would be, um, yeah, that's more what we're talking about here. And yeah, it looks like we've got some uh, ACT and DBP, DBT people out here. Um, radical acceptance, opposite of emotion action, being mindful of what you're doing. Yep, that's all good stuff. Oops. All right. Um, well, I appreciate your all's interaction and, you know, um, entertaining my thoughts about the personality disorders and how helpful it is to label these things. Um, I am more than happy to answer any questions. Um, I'll monitor the, the box here to see if anything comes through. Oh yeah, Brandy. <laughs> what was the book that you recommended from the motivational interviewing? Yeah, so the book that I mentioned, let me see if I have it. I'm sure I do have it on my shelf back here. But, you know, if you just do a Google search um, for motivational interviewing book, probably the first thing that's gonna pop up as a book by um, William Miller, Stephen Rolnick. Um, they're the developers of motivational interviewing. They were the folks involved in those um, original studies. I'm, I'm looking at my bookshelf right now if you're wondering what I'm doing. And there's a, a couple different ones. So there's kind of, there's like one book that is like everything about motivational interviewing and all the history and research involved in it. And that one's pretty darn dense. There's another one that I love to recommend called um, Motivational Interviewing in Healthcare. So it's for like healthcare folks, but it just really breaks it down into being more practical kinds of things. And that's the one that I end up recommending more. I believe that um, Rolnick is the first, uh, first author on that one and Miller's the second author. Um, but I know it's called Motivational Interviewing in Healthcare. It's a small paperback book, lots of practical examples. And if you wanted to learn more about that, that's probably what I would recommend. You know, they're going to have examples of like exercising and eating well and managing, taking your medicine. Um, but the, the strategies that you would use would be the same in a, a peer support kind of setting. All right. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Kyle. Dr. Davis, always a pleasure to have you um, with us for these trainings. I don't see that there's any other questions. Oh. Yeah, I see some here. And, you oh. know, feel like, I don't know how you feel about this, you know, but if you want to let people go, um, I'll stick around and answer a, a few more of these questions. But I know not everybody probably wants to stay to get their attendance. But Ellen has a question about um, delusional thinking that I, I wanted to answer. Yes. This is my official permission for you all to hop off if um, you don't have any other questions. So have a great rest of your day. Oh, okay. 
So I think I know what you're saying, Ellen, like delusional thinking. So could I could I can think of a couple examples right off the, the bat here. Um, double think contradictory beliefs. Double think is not a term that I'm familiar with, um, but in terms of delusional 